few of the other sessions, it's extremely easy to plant a tree. Even I can do it. But it's incredibly hard to get the right tree in the right place. And it's even harder to imagine how we're going to monitor this into the future. We need to be looking 50, 100 years, 200 years into the future before we can understand what might be going on in the planet and how we will be making changes to the planet. Things are changing rapidly with climate change and we have an increasing pressure on the planet. Technology is often blamed for some of this, uh, but we need to be realistic about this. We wouldn't be sitting here doing this, this conference without technology. A couple of years ago, this would have been absolutely impossible. And hopefully technology can allow us to actually go and move some of the data and information and allow us to plant the right tree in the right place. To give you some idea, at this present moment, the internet is streaming, streaming about 5.3 ter- um, exabytes of data every single day. That's for every single person on the planet, 1.5 gig. Imagine that information if we could use and utilize that kind of data for plants and for around the world. Also, the algorithms that we use every day as we're all sitting on the internet, we're continually sold things we don't particularly want, being given takeaways, sold games, etc. Imagine if we could use a small percentage of the energy and the algorithms that are used for that to actually do some good for the planet and allow us to sort of work with our trees and work with our planet. Hopefully, some of the sessions we're going to see today will get you into that uh, remit and we'll see some of the technologies we're going to go right from the top from very high level technologies where we're actually discovering uh, directly planting trees and seeds with drones discovering where we should be planting using the latest technologies and then we'll also look at how we connect our data and our data sets to allow the expertise to put the right tree in the right place make better decisions allow us to quantify success and the impact that we'll have on the ground so we'll move on relatively quickly. So our first uh, speaker today is uh, Dr. Stephen Elliott. He's from the Forest Restoration Research Unit at Chiang Mai uh, University, Thailand. And he'll be presenting on seven technology priorities for automating restoration of tropical forest ecosystems. Thank you. Over to Stephen. Hello, everybody. I'm Stephen Elliott. I'm from Chiang Mai University in Northern Thailand. And today I will be presenting to you seven technological advancements needed for automated forest restoration, particularly of tropical forest ecosystems, along with a couple of colleagues of mine, George Gale from King Mongkut University and uh, Dr. Pimon Ratien Sawad, who's uh, one of my colleagues here in Chiang Mai. Before we begin, I'd just like to say we've had a brand new website open just a couple of days ago and everything that I'm going to say to you today is uh, published in the book that you can see there on the right. Um, so if you're interested in any of these stuff, do please go to our website and um, click to open the book. It's a free download. All over the world, millions of people are planting billions of trees largely to meet the targets that have been set by a whole host of international um, initiatives to promote tree planting largely as a result of the realization that planting trees and young forests can suck up enormous quantities of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and help to mitigate global warming. One of these challenges has been the bond challenge. Uh, the target is 350 million hectares by the year 2030. And progress with these sorts of challenges has been very good indeed. We have reached 210 million hectares already pledged for the bond challenge. But what that means is that most of the easy sites have already been done. And by easy sites, I mean flat sites adjacent to roads um, on, uh, that have not already been claimed for agriculture. What you see on this slide are, is the reality of the remaining sites for, that are available for forest restoration. They are steep, they are covered in weeds, and to get to them, you have to go along the kind of roads that you see there on, on the left. So most of the Reforestation, reforestation sites available um, are largely inaccessible. And we're doing forest restoration with prehistoric tools. On the left here, you see hose to, used to dig 
um, tree planting holes, which have not changed in their design from the Iron Age. And on the right, you see a basket there used to carry heavy loads of seedlings, mostly in their plastic bags full of soil, so very heavy. And those kinds of uh, baskets would have been uh, familiar to somebody living in the Stone Age. There's got to be a better way to do it. And so in 2015, we brought together a large and various group of people to try and drag the technology of forest restoration out of the Stone Age and into the Drone Age. This was a, a quite a unique group of people. Uh, we had computer scientists and aeronautical engineers uh, sitting down with uh, seed biologists and forest ecologists, quite often people who never really get to talk to each other and exchange ideas um, very often in, in real life. And we ran this conference uh, in the usual way. We had um, experts in the field to introduce the various topics. And then we sat around in these discussion groups that you can see up there top left, sat around in the discussion groups. And we came up with around 95 proposals for further development to develop technologies that would advance the idea, the concept of automated forest restoration. And at the end of the workshop, uh, we had a vote. We had to get from 95 project ideas down to around seven main topic themes. And here are the delegates um, at the end uh, voting on these ideas. So we, we boiled it down to seven research priorities uh, to advance automated forest restoration. Now, of course, all this happened five years ago. And so what we did is we got everybody together again um, uh, two or three weeks ago, and we asked them to revise this list that we generated in 2015. So what I'm going to present to you now is the revised list in descending order of priority as perceived by experts in the field. Topmost priority was identified as replacing tree planting with drone seeding. This means dropping seed bombs or seed pellets from drones. The difference between seed, a seed bomb and a seed pellet is that a, a seed bomb is made out of some kind of biodegradable material um, and it has structure, so it can have fins and a point to uh, make sure that the projectile lands and stays in position. Seed pellets, on the other hand, are already widely used in agriculture. Um, so that technology can be transferred across the forestry, I think, very easily. But the problem is with seed pellets is when you drop them, they tend to roll around, roll to the lowest point in the, in the landscape. So the first proposal was to compare um, various seed bombs or seed pellets with each other to see what, which is the most efficient projectile. Then there's the issue of what you make these seed bombs or seed pellets out of. Base materials, uh, testing different types of materials, biochar, whether or not to include forest soil and so on. And in addition to the base materials, there's the question of functional additives. For example, adding chemicals that will repel seed predators, uh, rodents mostly. Seed predation is a terrible problem with direct seeding in the field for forest restoration. And then what about hydrogels? Adding hydrogels to prevent desiccation, the second most highest cause of death of seeds in, uh, in forest restoration. And then there's um, things like adding the spores of mycorrhizal fungi and so on. All of this could be tested. And the last issue under the drone seeding heading was to compare propulsion versus gravity. Do we need to put these seed pellets into some kind of gun and fire them into the soil so that there's a certain amount of burial? Or is it enough simply to drop these seed projectiles from drones and let uh, gravity deposit them where, where they will? A major issue with all of this is weed control. Because when you're planting a seed to do forest restoration, instead of planting a, you know, a seedling, which is 20 to 30 centimetres tall, when 
a seedling germinates from a seed, it's tiny, and it immediately gets attacked by the surrounding vegetation. So competition with weeds is a major issue. Luckily, our delegates came up with uh, the number two priority is to develop smarter, safer weed control, exploiting a property called allelopathy. Now, allelopathy, for those of you who may not know, is the chemical control of weeds by living trees. And an example of this you can see on the right there. This is a malina tree growing in an open field, and you can see quite clearly there's no grass growing within um, a radius of about one and a half meters from the base of the tree. And that's because this tree secretes chemicals that kills off grasses. So rather than use the existing um, herbicides uh, for forest restoration, the most commonly used one is glyphosate, one which everybody hates. How about trying to develop herbicides from allelopathic trees that already exist. So one of the things we could do is to go out there and find uh, tree species or tree varieties that have particularly strong allelopathic properties and make sure that they are included in the trees that are planted for forest restoration or seeds that are dropped from drones. And the second um, thing we could do with this is actually extract those allelo chemicals from the trees, um, concentrate them, investigate them, and use them to develop uh, species-specific herbicides. It should be safer and smarter than normal herbicides because it's unlikely that these allelopathic chemicals are going to kill trees, so they're more likely to kill weeds than they are to kill trees. And then what to do with them? Well, one of the things you could do with them is to use drones to spray these chemicals. Um, so if you're going to use a drone to spray herbicides, obviously you don't want the herbicides going on the trees. You want the drone to be able to make decision, spray on the weeds and don't spray on the trees. And for that, it needs some kind of artificial intelligence to recognize the difference between a weed and a tree. And luckily, number three, on the list of priorities from our workshop delegates was exactly that, artificial intelligence for auto species recognition. Now, these kinds of technologies would be tremendously useful for developing automated forest restoration, not just for distinguishing between weeds and trees, but also for locating seed trees. If we're going to have drones dropping tens of thousands of, tree of seeds per day, then we need to find the seeds to feed into those drone systems. And that means locating vast numbers of seed trees in natural forests. This kind of technology would also be useful for pre-restoration site assessments, making sure that we don't simply add, add um, species that are already there. Uh, we're adding, we're adding uh, we are increasing the species richness of these sites. And of course, for post-intervention monitoring, looking at the tree species that come up as a result of the restoration. There has been quite a bit of progress made with this since 2015, but delegates um, on the online discussion group thought that we should keep it at about number three. It's done by combining the data from various sensors that can be put onto drones. We're talking the regular RBG cameras, hyperspectral imagery and um, LIDAR is now becoming very popular too. And if necessary, combining data from all these different sensors and um, feeding them into artificial intelligence systems, machine learning systems that will translate the signals into species signatures. In order to to do that with AI systems, one of the things you're going to want is a database of images. And this leads us into number four, which is, um, again, medium priority now, integrated databases for species selection and for especially for species site matching. One of the biggest decisions that has to be made um, when you're doing forest restoration is to put the right species in the right uh, places. So. We need enormous quantities of information, particularly the distribution of the species, 
their successional status, whether they are um, pioneer species or old growth species. And then there's the functional traits that can be used to predict whether or not a tree is going to do well in a certain place, phenology data, when to collect the seeds, seed sources, um, how to actually grow planting stock in the nurseries if you're going to if you're going to do some kind of tree planting, and then the expected rates of survival and growth of these trees after they go into the ground. Well, matching species with site conditions uh, and project objectives is what this one is, is, is really all about. And there's been some quite considerable progress with this. Um, Bioversity has brought out a system called Diversity for Restoration, uh, which is species site mapping in South America. And the World Agroforestry Center since 2015 has brought out Africa Tree Finder. So again, there has been some quite a lot of um, uh, progress in this um, in this respect. But what we're not seeing is the building up of image libraries that will be required for that AI training that I talked about in priority number three. So if there's an area, if there's a, a gap to be filled, I think it lies in databases of um, image libraries for AI training. We need to know what trees look like from above and not necessarily by looking at um, herbarium specimens anymore. Number five is improved technologies for um, monitoring wildlife. Now, once you've actually done your restoration, of course, you, you're interested in does the biodiversity come back? And we've been using static um, camera traps to do this on a more or less automated basis um, for years. And you can see the civet um, image there, top right. Um, but the problem with uh, Camera traps is, of course, they're only in one place. Are there sensors that we can put on drones that will enable drones to fly over large areas and um, record the presence and the species of wildlife? So it was thought that thermal imagery from drones um, is the way to do that. But um, although there has been a little bit of progress in this since 2015, thermal imagery still suffers from the basic problem that it, it, it's not capable of, of penetrating dense tropical forest canopies enough to, um, to give you um, uh, accurate representation of species that are not just in the, in the treetops. And there's, there's an example of a thermal image of some, some monkeys on the, on the right there, but um, they're not covered up by the forest canopy. And the second type of technology where we felt there was room for improvement was automated birdsong recognition. This involves putting um, arrays of microphones into the forest and um, using AI to identify bird species from their songs and also uh, using the microphones to triangulate where those songs are coming from. So you get an idea of the number of territories, bird territories, that are within earshot of the microphones. And that enables you to start doing some calculations of population density. Number six was automated assessment of degradation and restoration. Again, this is using drone based imagery to uh, look at the relative ratios between crown cover, tree crown cover, weed cover, soil and rock cover to have a look at forest structure using the structure from motion technologies and coming up with indices of carbon capture from uh, from those um, from those images. Again, this is another area where there's been some progress, but it's still not widely available to um, restoration practitioners. And the biggest gap we found in this type of technology was the ability to count and measure small saplings. So trees just after they've germinated and, and been growing a while, anything um, smaller than about one meter in height, it's very, very difficult to do much with, with those images um, from drones. The least 
The lowest priority was improve and test drone tech. This slipped down, I think, from the number three position to the number seven position, largely because all of those problems that existed in 2015 with, um, with battery life, with uh, connectability of the drones, the range of the drones, and particularly obstacle avoidance have largely been solved. You can walk into a department store now and buy a drone with obstacle avoidance in all directions. So yes, we still need improvements to drones, but it's not the critical factor that it was back in 2015. So in conclusion, uh, there has been considerable progress in technologies for automated forest restoration since 2015, particularly in the areas of image capture and analysis for restoration planning and also for monitoring. The most urgent and important gaps uh, are technologies to improve the success of drone seeding, uh, which still have pretty low success rates, and to enable automated weed control, which really hasn't been tackled, tackled at all. In addition to the technologies themselves, these technologies must be affordable and easy to operate. We cannot continue um, promoting these technologies if only PhD students can actually use them. And ideally, the aim is for an integrated system where all these technologies work together seamlessly and autonomously. And on the right hand side there, you see our idealized auto restoration workflow, which explains how that might um, be brought about. And for the young listeners out there, the graduate students, if you are considering topics for your master's thesis or your PhD thesis, do please read the full um, research agenda on our website and try to select the topics that are being suggested because these are topics that have been through a, a, a really um, intensive selection process by a quorum of experts. So I'd like to thank all the workshop participants and the authors of the chapters of the proceedings of the book who gave their time freely for this endeavor. Um, and again, if you want to access the full research agenda, please go to our brand new website. Um, the volume on the right there is right on the opening page of the website. Click on that and you can download it for, for, for free. Thank you very much.